Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. In each episode, I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Cheryl Miller, director of the Hertog Foundation. It is an organization that offers educational programs for outstanding individuals who seek to influence the intellectual, civic, and political life of the United States. Previously, Cheryl worked in the executive office of the president at the New York Times, the American Enterprise Institute, and the America's Future Foundation. You can learn more about Cheryl by visiting hertogfoundation.org. Cheryl, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. As our listeners have heard, you work for the Hertog Foundation. What does it do? Sure. So, Kevin, um, the Hertog Foundation is a private family foundation um, run, as you might expect, by a Mr. Hertog, Roger Hertog, and his wife, Susan. And it basically just has two arms, um, a grant-making arm, so kind of traditional philanthropy, and then a programming arm, which I think probably is the, of the most interest to your audience, which I understand is college students, recent grads, young professionals here in D.C., people who are interested in public policy. And the programming arm, which is what I originally came to the Hurt Talk Foundation to run, got started back in 2010, and I joined at Hurt Talk in 2014. But it sponsors and runs fellowships for college students undergraduates, for recent grads, and also for young professionals in politics. And that's politics broadly understood. So public policy, domestic policy, foreign policy, but also political philosophy. We run classes on everything from Aristotle to Plato to Chinese grand strategy, domestic policy, American democratic capitalism. We bring in a really interesting group of um, instructors. So typically kind of scholar practitioners, people like Yuval Levin at AEI, who I understand has been on this podcast as well, to educate young people who are interested in possibly pursuing a path in public service and what that might look like. So I've also gotten more involved in the grant making side, but that's less exciting and more like reading reports and writing reports. What was the career path that led you to the position of director at the Hertog Foundation? I didn't actually plan to go into public policy or politics. I um, was an undergrad student at the University of Dallas, a small liberal arts school in Texas. And like a lot of students who come to me and who probably listen to this program, I really love the world of ideas. I love the great books, kind of foundational texts and reading them and discussing them with other people. For me, what seemed like the logical choice was like to keep going to school forever, basically. And so I had started a PhD program at the University of Chicago at the Committee on Social Thought. And that was really the plan, was to become an academic. But I was doing a fellowship in California, and I met a number of people who were already out in D.C. doing policy work. And they convinced me to spend a summer interning in D.C. They, you know, just set my resume around and somebody picked it up. Um, So I ended up interning in D.C. for a very small foreign policy think tank and knew nothing about foreign policy, no classes in it whatsoever, but got to learn on the job. That really was a huge change, a kind of transformative moment for me that I hadn't realized. Around the same time, I began to have some doubts about whether the academic path was the right path for me. The job market then was terrible. I think now it's like 20 times terrible. And I was also kind of worried about some of the trends I saw in the academy, this kind of tendency towards hyper-specialization, this disdain um, that some um, professors had for the idea of teaching, like this was a burden that you had to do um, as opposed to your research rather than the core of education. Also kind of disdain for the practical. And that's not true, obviously, of everyone in the academy, but it is definitely a very strong undercurrent that some people just think you are focused on the experts in your field and what they do in the real world doesn't really matter that much. And I'd always been a little bit more of a practical oriented person. So I wanted to kind of see like, how do these ideas that we're studying match up with real life? Does that matter? What what is their relevance? And that wasn't always like a question that um, my professors necessarily thought that I should be thinking about. So I ended up staying in DC. It wasn't really quite a choice. 
I just kind of kept getting new jobs and I got to do a lot of different things and have a variety of different experiences in the world of politics. I worked in think tanks. Um, I worked in journalism. I worked in the White House speech writing office for a while before I ended up ending up at the Hertog Foundation. Eventually, I just realized I'm never actually going back and doing the PhD. Excellent. What are your responsibilities and what does your average day look like as a director? I don't really have an average day or if I do, it varies by season. We just ended our summer season, um, which is our most intensive programming season. And sadly, we had to have it virtually via Zoom. Um, We usually bring our college students um, to Washington, D.C. for the summer. And I should say for your um, listeners that this is free. We provide housing. We provide a stipend. We provide all the course material. So it's a great deal. Sadly, we weren't able to offer the full extent of that deal because of the pandemic. So we just, but we just finished eight weeks of online programming. And that's like 16 two-week courses that we had on offer for almost 200 students. And our students call it politics boot camp, and it definitely has that feel to it. But it's also like, for me, a dream gig, which is I just get to sit in and observe the classes and how they're going. And again, these are classes like we had Brian Garston from Yale University teaching the Gorgias. Um, We had Dan Blumenthal from AEI teaching Chinese grand strategy. Yuval Levin, as I said, Adam White teaching for our program on domestic policy questions. So taught by these really great instructors. And I get to be kind of an eternal student um, watching over that and making sure that everything goes as planned. But there's a lot of prep that goes into these programs. We start planning the next year's programs basically as soon as we finish the summer program. So no rest for the weary. And we finalize a plan. That's me going back and forth with Mr. Hertog about like where we think there are opportunities, where there might be student demand. Um, what kind of topics are undertaught. We go back and forth on that. And then once we get a plan, we start recruitment. So that's reaching out to students, reaching out to professors. And then we have this crazy application season where we go through a thousand plus applications and select our finalists, interview them and select our class. And we also have programs going on outside the summer. So I'll get started soon on a um, set of seminars on strategy and national security, looking at different challenges from rival nations for young professionals that we hold in the evening. Um, We also hold shorter programs for the college students. And then we're finally, we're thinking about online programs and what we might have to offer for people who are stuck at home because of the pandemic and maybe aren't, are deferring, but would still like to have a learning opportunity. It's always changing, but I think that's something that I like about it. You've had a variety of positions, broadly speaking, in the public sphere, and you've described yourself as getting to be an eternal, ongoing student. From all that, what lessons have you taken away about governance? I I did spend some time in the White House um, working for the speechwriting office. I helped do research for uh, Mike Gerson, John McConnell, and Matt Scully. They were kind of the triumvirate um, of speechwriters to President George W. Bush, and getting to learn from them was amazing. And it was also just really helpful to see kind of politics from the inside. I don't think you can realize how fast decisions have to be made. It's always with imperfect information. When our students read about policy decisions, they always read about it, you know, from a position of hindsight, you know, whether that's journalism or, you know, going out much further, historical accounts. And so it's hard to kind of get into the head of like, how are the policymakers thinking about it at that particular time? And to realize like just how difficult it is and you're not thinking about it from like, here's option A, which is great. And here's option B, which is not so great. It's more um, option A is really terrible and option B is worse. So I think that's really helpful. It kind of sobers you up, gives you a sense of humility about you know, what is possible. And I think a little bit of empathy um, for policymakers while still having a, you know, a sense of accountability. So that was one thing, and I think it's really helpful for young people to spend some time in government, you know, whether that's on the Hill, because unless you live it, you just can't really know it. And then, I mean, in terms of the Hertog Foundation, I think one thing I found in my career is that I do a lot of, like, keeping all the plates spinning in the air. I'm trying to coordinate a lot um, all at one time and overseeing it. And there aren't a lot of people actually with my particular skill set in D.C. or, or fewer than you would expect which is like a lot of people, especially in the think tank world, like to be in the world of ideas, thinking about stuff. And then like how you actually execute is kind of a second, uh, an afterthought. But that means it's really hard to get things going. And so I think if you 
are interested in getting to DC realize that's kind of an, like everyone has opinions and ideas of like the way that things should be. But a skill that's much in demand is somebody who is actually willing to kind of get their hands dirty and get things done and execute on the plans. And so, and then you can also be, of course, involved with coming up with the plan as well and have a big hand in that. So I think one thing that students should think about is like a little bit of a no job too small attitude because it can get you to bigger places than you might have expected. Clearly, you love your job at the Hertog Foundation, but what's the toughest part of it? Is it keeping all the plates spinning? Is it trying to run a program in the middle of COVID-19 or is it something else? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about this, which is like my job is pretty awesome. So um, even the tough stuff is actually fun and interesting challenge that I always learn from. I think one thing that I've been really working hard on is kind of figuring out what students want, what they're most interested in. Also, how to reach students who don't already have a taste or have had experience for the kind of learning that we do at the Hertog Foundation. We're really lucky. We bring in lots of applications every year. Um, we get to pick from really high, a highly qualified applicant pool. But I know that we're missing students, that there are a lot of students who just haven't had the experience of like liberal education and the kind of capacious way that we think about politics and how to find them. So that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, people who aren't already plugged into politics but would benefit from this, because I think that's just a huge pool of college students in America and like how we find them is the big question. That's probably one of the big questions that I keep noodling over and thinking about. I think the other thing is I'm starting to work on the grant making side with um, Mr. Hertog and he's been in philanthropy for a very long time, which is great he, and has a very decided view about you know, what he wants to do, what kind of projects he'd like to fund, his areas of interest. And so I get to learn a lot from him and that's great. But trying to find new and innovative projects, again, that can actually get executed because, as I said, a lot of people have really great ideas, but then, like, how do you get them going? Um, so identifying those for him and helping him expand his philanthropy and find new worthwhile projects is also something, like, a big challenge that I'm about to embark on, but I'm looking forward to that part. Let me ask my closing question. Why public service? So I think maybe this gets back to, again, kind of coming full circle which is one of the things that I really love about DC. And I think my students are always particularly surprised to find out, which is like one, there's a lot of exiles from academia here. People who like myself thought they were gonna embark on an academic career and then realize, you know, for various reasons that, that wasn't gonna work out and instead ended up working in policy, maybe in fields that they hadn't previously imagined for themselves. But that means that there is a way to stay seriously engaged with the world of ideas that's not the academy, which is something that I just, didn't fully realize when I was an undergraduate or a young grad student starting out that so many of the people you meet here, we bring a lot of really wonderful speakers um, to meet with our students. And so many of them have had a liberal arts education. And those books and ideas are really foundational to the way of their way of thinking. I mean, one great example is Yuval Levin, you know, a preeminent policy analyst, but somebody who studied with um, Leon Cass wonderful scholar at the um, University of Chicago, studied great books with him, and that really does influence the way he thinks. And this is true of, you know, policymakers higher up. We have had General Jim Mattis speak to our students before, and hearing him talk about Thucydides and the things that he read as an undergraduate, and then um, later on, just as outside reading to deepen his thinking, those things still really matter. And so if that's something that really you care deeply about, there is a way to continue following that passion, and there's a lot of different ways to do it rather than, you know, kind of the one set track that the university has to offer you. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com.